The Axl Rose Slash Beef is one of the most famous feuds in rock and roll history. Of course, it's been a few years now since that feud has publicly ended, Axl and Slash both being members of Guns N' Roses together again. But for a long time, many people believed that could never happen. One person who did believe it could happen, however, was Mark Cantor, one of Guns N' Roses' original photographers and a friend of the band since the very beginning. Back in 2015, when the GNR reunion tour hadn't yet been announced, Mark believed that Slash and Axel were already starting to make amends, and he also predicted that Slash could tour again with Axel. In this interview, Mark discusses all those things, and he also shares his thoughts on why he feels Guns N' Roses was a special band, and why there haven't been many groundbreaking rock bands in recent years. I did this interview with Mark for my documentary, What is Classic Rock? If you'd like to see the full documentary, the links are available below. This video is previously unreleased footage. Make sure to subscribe for more. How do you feel about the news coming out that last week apparently Slash and Axel made amends like they're better now? Well, there was actually, actually, I haven't talked to Slash about that, but I know that there was some big clues that that was happening. But anyways, the fact that Axel was able to put out uh, a DVD a year ago that has the old songs on it and there's sync rights that need to be obtained by the songwriters and Axel would never give Slash that and Slash would never give Axel that because neither one of them wanted the other one to record the old songs of new people. You could record them and put them out as music but not video because they're sync rights but the fact that Slash had signed off on that means that Duff may have, you know, kind of been a good middleman and got, you know, kind of made some kind of peace. And then Axel signed off that Slash could use it on his DVD that he, he just released this year. But the big, those are two clues that, that things had changed in, in between them. Not necessarily friends, but at least not so much animosity. But the big clue was Del James, who was Axel's right-hand man, tweeted, happy, birth, happy 50th birthday to Slash, may you have 50 more, or something like that. That, and that was happened July, uh, July 23rd, I believe, so. That was the clue that the hatred was gone from the act from the GNR camp towards Slash, and that they had some sort of understanding, whether they had met in person or talked on the phone or texted or who knows. But could have just been email. It doesn't matter. Whatever it was, the animosity had diminished, and they might not be friends like. We're going to dinner, let's go bowling or whatever, but at least that barrier of, 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 of that Berlin Wall or whatever you want to call it is broken. So, you know, whether or not they're hanging out and having barbecues, that's a whole other issue. But it's a very good sign for the future for many different reasons. It means they can now celebrate the children they made together. You know, you don't see much coming out. You don't see DVDs coming out. You don't see box sets of, you know, Appetite for Destruction, 25th year remix, or, or not remix, but something with extras, you know, outtakes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, different mix, yeah, you know, completely different mixes of songs with different fun parts to it. Now you might see something like that because they could, they, they, now they have an understanding and maybe they could work with that. Whether or not, there's going to be a reunion. You know, I think someday Slash will be on stage with Axel. Slash is someone that I never thought would have been sober. In fact, I didn't even think he'd be alive at this point in his life. So the fact that he has kids and he's a good father and he's sober, what keeps him sober is the fact that he can create music and then tour on it. Create music and then tour on it. He needs to be working 365 days a year, basically. And there's no way that he can do that with Guns N' Roses, no matter what. Because Guns N' Roses is not a 365-day band. Flash will create new music every single year and tour. What made Guns N' Roses so special when they first started out is there were five guys from five different, you know, basically from good music they grew up in the 60s and 70s, good music. Different parts of it, like Duff was the punk rock music, was the kind of Rolling Stones, Hanoi Rocks guy. Slash was the blues, hard rock guy. Steven had some funk, and Axel was just a drop of everything. So it was a good mix. And what actually made them so good is because they all needed each other to accomplish something great. And they all add, they all complemented it. Slash started a song, the rest of the band jumped on it and finished it. Izzy started a song, Slash jumped on it and changed it. So they all 
needed each other to, you know, they couldn't accomplish what they accomplished without each other. And they also had, you know, they're, they are, in my opinion, the last rock and roll band with an image. You know, an image meaning that you would go out and maybe go to a poster shop one night and see a poster and, and buy a poster for your wall. Like we did in the 70s with Zeppelin and Aerosmith and, you know, Van Halen. There was always something, there was something about that poster that made you, you know, there was an image in there in the poster. And the guys and all the guys in Guns N' Roses just radiated with image and, and attitude. And, and so it was basically songwriting. Uh, ability, you know, guitar playing, guitar sound, image, and collaboration. I think in 1985, uh, rock and roll needed a kick in the ass, and Guns N' Roses came and did it. But there was nothing going on in 1985 as far as bands that were coming out. Uh, Guns N' Roses influenced bands to look like them. They just couldn't sound like them. But at least they tried, and they looked like them. Uh, now, you know, here we are 30 years later and, and rock and roll, guess what, needs a kick in the ass again because you don't have that, there's nothing fun about it. There's nothing, I don't even go to shows anymore, there's nothing, what am I going to see? They're boring. There's nothing there. I mean, I like the music, I listen to it in my car or at home, but I'm not going to go to a show because they're not going to impress me. There's nothing there for me. There's nothing to see. I could hear something, but there's nothing to see. So I just think that you know, something has gotten lost. I'm not quite sure what or why, but you know, they, they say Kurt Cobain killed the rock star, but that's not true. Kurt Cobain at least had an attitude and he had an image, even though it wasn't what the images were before he came. He created something, he changed the way he dressed in his street clothes, but still looked rock and roll. I think maybe that was what started people not dressing up anymore. But they just didn't have the attitude that Kurt had, so it just got lost. I feel that in today's world where we live in, because the record companies are pretty much abolished, and there's really no money to be made on records, money is really made on touring and merchandise. And years ago, you, you, would get, you would give the merchandise away to sell the music. Now you're giving the music away to hopefully sell the merchandise, so things have changed. But um, I, it just... You know, people, the only way you're really going to make it today in a band is, is if you know someone, and there's very few people to, that, that are able to get your music out there and, and, and record it, but there's, it's just, the clubs have made it so difficult for bands to go out there and start and get a start because they want you to sell $600 worth of tickets to play a 35 minute set. And how many bands can do that? I mean, you know, how many bands have maybe rich parents that could give their kid 600 bucks to just buy tickets that they're going to have to give away because they're not going to sell 60 or 70 tickets. They might be able to sell 25 to their friends. And mm -hmm. it, it, then you get to the club and, 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 and it's the, this, if you look at the club, the club is, there's nothing going on in the club. There's not, the audience is of what you bring, you know, of who came to see you that you forced to get there. So it's not... In the old days, it used to be people would go to the clubs to have hang out and have fun, and whatever music was there, maybe they liked it, maybe they didn't. Now nobody goes to the clubs anymore. That's the problem. So the best you're going to get is a band that's playing birthday parties or you know weekend parties or something like that, and there's some energy in that, and maybe they got some attitude, and maybe they're a fit. And the problem is, who's going to see them? So I think there probably there has to be some garage bands out there that have potential to look the part, not only sound the part, but who, who's going to discover them? There's so few people left to pick who's going to be on the radio, who's going to be you know, on TV or whatever you want to call it, uh, that it's just a dying industry. The, the internet pretty much killed the, the, the record business company, uh, companies, and, and that's, um, that's what's slowly actually killing new bands from, from coming up. I'm sure they're out there, I just, we, we don't see them because nobody's discovered them because there's no one to discover them or very few people to discover them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think it is. The record company scouts used to come to these gigs every now and then and they, they might see you and discover you and say something, hey, I want to start working with you or, you know, I saw, I saw the end of that in 2008. 
when my son, now he's out of college, but when he was in high school, he was in bands, and there was still, the record companies were dying, but there were still people that would see them and say, hey, we'd like to work with you. We're from blah, blah, blah records. We don't have really much money to offer you, but we could, we want to work with you. We think that you have some songs that might work or, you know, something like that, but now it's just gone, you know? It's just gone. Mm -hmm. and, and and my son's band had attitudes. They, they looked like Thin Lizzy and UFO. They, they had, you know, they had that 70s vibe to them. But the music, they were also putting together some decent music. Now, you know, it fell apart after that. You know, they all went to college and that, that was the end of that. And I don't think they were gonna really make it anyways, but the fact is, there was still a tiny bit of chance that somebody could have found them. Now, I, don't, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. The best, a, a best thing that, that can happen is a management company sees, hears you, picks you up, and maybe they can get you on that band's warp tour or something like that. It's, it's an opening act on an obscure stage somewhere, and maybe somebody might see you if you're good, but you're still not going to really, the chances of making it are so hard. You would think it'd be easier because of the internet that you can get your, you know, I remember when MySpace was around and you could put your music on MySpace. Facebook somehow never really, never really worked in that way. MySpace seemed like more for bands. I know people can put videos on Facebook, but it just didn't, MySpace you can click and hear the song. There was all kinds of, you know, you can hear the audio. You would think that with the internet you can get your music out there. You can actually probably put your music on iTunes, but the problem is who's going to find it? There's nobody to promote it, and that's the problem. Hey, thanks for watching. My name is Daniel Sarkissian. I'm an independent filmmaker from Toronto.